Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, Run, Blog, Run. This is our program, Socialing the Distance. We're with Tom Bedford, who is the race director for the Richmond Run Fest. Tom, great seeing you. Hey, it's good to be here. And you're in lovely Portugal right now? I am, I am. Yeah, it's not so lovely today, but um, it's certainly, uh, it, I've certainly had two weeks of decent running and uh, really good weather and, uh, yeah, had to get out of London. The pubs were shutting now, so we needed to get out. Well, you look charming as always, you know, and I hope you have a, an adult beverage nearby. And uh, good, there we go. Um, so one of the things I've wanted to learn about is uh, you and your lovely wife, Jade, uh, have done the Richmond Run Fest, and you've really done something exciting and unique in the UK. Tell us a little bit about how you guys put this event together. Well, I mean, you know, like like all good things, okay, they were borrowed, borrowed and stolen from somewhere else. But um, but my uh, my background, I guess, um, being brought up with my old man, being the race director of London Marathon, um, just after university, I decided to um, rather than get a proper job, I could be a bum um, and tour tour the state. So I went out and and worked at every big race, Boulder, Peachtree. Um, obviously, fell in love with California. As um, and and um, and many women there, and um, I, I enjoyed doing some work work um, some work experience there, and um, fell in absolutely fell in love with rock and roll races, which was just so unique, um, so new to the sport at the time, mm-hmm. and um, so yeah, so that whole sort of different concept of yes, you know, let's be serious about running, let's be serious about um, um, you know you know, the actual distance and with elites, um, but also let's look at a way of having a party after and that. So um, when I came back from um, America, um, I just met my, uh, my a girlfriend at the time and, um, and it, we were just out of 2012 and the question was, what are you going to do for, what is Richmond's uh, Olympic re- legacy? Richmond is in West London. Um, okay. On the Thames, we've got beautiful venues, greenery, greenest part, uh, borough of London. Um, so we were like, right, well, what's going to be the, what's going to be a, a, a Olympic legacy? This legacy word was massive around London and that. So yeah, so we were able to um, create a race. I was able to call up um, a botanical gardens called Kew Gardens. Um, I said, listen, I'd, how would you like Mo Farah running around your gardens? I went um, before all, all of this at university, I used to train with Mo and um, we were all part of the same athletics club growing up. And, um, and yeah, so uh, I said, how would you like Mo doing that? And they were like, well, we, you don't know Mo. And I said, well, okay, if you Google Mo Farah, Tom Bedford, Kingston Bridge, you'll know that we got drunk one night and we ended up jumping off Kingston Bridge into the Thames. So um, that, that at least proved that I, that I knew him. And then, uh, and uh, yeah, we were able to create the rest is history. And we've, you know, we now last year until COVID came, um, we had 10,000 finishes. We have a, a 5K evening run that turns into a disco party, um, a, a flat 10K, um, a half and full marathon. So um, we're 10,000 10, plus now. Every runner gets a free beer after, which is a, a bit of a rock and roll legacy. Great medals sure. like rock and roll and, and great Nike t-shirts. So, um, so yeah, so we've done that in eight years now and um and this year has obviously been a little bit different but we we were still able to get things going this year and um and yeah but that's a that's pretty much a a quick history of that now you hold it in like a so you don't have state parks like we do in the u.s is it a a park reserve is that what you would call it yeah i mean it's it's it's, so it's it's london's second biggest tourist attraction Okay. But yeah, I mean, you know, you have botanical gardens in the, sure, in, yeah. in the state, so it's it's literally you know the the world's number one botanical garden. Um, wow. And um, so yeah, so we sort of start most of our races there. The ten k starts and finishes there. The marathon does that, but we sort of have a bit of a a party uh, music party in another venue. Um, but you know, it's flat as a pancake, um, just beautiful. You know, you, you've got the world's plants there. You know, so I'm not, you know, you'll know what a botanical garden is. But you know, you go through different zones and different areas, almost like mm-hmm. a theme park. And um, you know, one second you're running 
um, in a Japanese garden, the next thing you're running through redwoods in, uh, in Canada, and you've got the smells that follow you around and, and, and everything else. There's, um, there's even a Q, uh, Q palace there, which is where the royal family, um, during the war specifically, um, a, a few better of the royal family lived in this wow. botanical garden. So it's, the history there is unreal. Um, they've actually got some decent Olympic history as well. They, I mean, for 2012, they did 100 days to go and then they had the Olympic um, torch run through their sort of thing. So it's, it's not really a big sporting, um, it's not a venue and it's not sort of like a park, like you've got Richmond Park and Bushy Park, which um, is also beautiful. Um, but yeah, it's, geez, it's, a, it's an absolute stunning venue. And, um, and yeah, we, we, eight years ago, um, we couldn't believe that there wasn't anything happening there. Um, so yeah, so we sort of um, blagged our way in, I guess. Uh, Chris Thompson's run there a few times. Yep, yep. He, he keeps on knocking up some um, um, personal bests and uh, and everything with our 10k and uh, and he and he won the marathon last year and won a won a uh, trip to the Cayman Islands. Um, so yeah, he keeps coming back. We keep increasing the prizes for him and uh, and, um, and and that. But yeah, no, we 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 always try and invite you know have Olympians. You know, listen, sure. we haven't got a big you know like everywhere the the sponsorship budget's not not massive um we'd like more competitive races but it sits at the um the start of september so it's a bit of a weird time for from from an elite running point of view in europe um mm -hmm. you've either got you know when we're normally a week after or on the same weekend of the, as the great north run so you know the, the they're a, they're a serious outfit and they will take a lot of leaps, but we try and keep something local and we've got loads of olympians training just down the road in teddington i mean it's the that part of London's the epicenter of British uh, distance running. I mean, it's where the, it's the, it's where the London Marathon was created in a pub. Um, you've also got the park runs, which have gone around the world now um, um, in, the, in the same borough as well. And Mo Farah went to at St. Mary's uh, University as well. So it's got some real heritage. My, my old man back in the 70s when he was world record holder, um, you know, he was doing a lot of his training uh, uh, there as well sort of thing. So it's, um, you know, Usain Bolt's agents there. It's got, geez, it's got every, it's just this magnet and epicenter of um, lots of successful things in distance uh, world running as well. So yeah, great venue, great part of London. One of the things that you brought up, uh, your, your dad, uh, Dave Bedford, uh, David introduced me to the London Marathon. In fact, him and uh, Ian Stewart, started bringing me over about 2006 and my favorite thing I have to tell you was at the cocktail party on the little barge that didn't move when your dad would get up with the drink and welcome everybody to the greatest marathon in the world and standing next to him was Guy Morse, Mary Wittenberg and I totally lost it every time because I knew how much he was enjoying saying it <laughs> kind of shoving it to them and also how true it was, you know. Um, what do you think makes London Marathon in, in the legacy that your pop put in so special? You know, li listen, I, I think, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, what is number one? What would make number one uh, the, uh, a marathon number one? And I don't think it, I, I don't think it's right. I think, you know, I, I, there's a lot of tongue and cheek. Um, sure. um, you know, New York likes to think it likes to think it's number one. So when when my old man probably was saying that, it's, it, it, it does that more to wind up probably more other people than actually giving a damn whether it's true or not. I mean, sure. you know, this, the, the elite field. Yes, you know, that the, they, they have, you know, it's flat, it's fast, it's sort of not the fastest, say Berlin and everything else. But, you know, it's, listen, it doesn't matter. I, I'm a massive soccer fan. Um, you know, soccer, soccer, you can appreciate it around the world, you know, for different ways it's played, the, the, the different way it's, it's um, you know, countries enjoy to attack what's what type of football uh, you know they like to play and, and and everything else and it's got its own unique taste so as much as much as you know you could you know that's a drunken conversation and you, if you yeah. had to put a rank people or rank marathons on on that then you know yes you can do it but at the end of the day as long as the the, the industry is, is is strong it's got its uniqueness you know you can't you can't knock boston's history you can't yeah. you know the, you can't knock the 
the, the the Central Park and that sort of you know that that sort of finish there as well. They're, they're all very unique and mm-hmm. um, and you know I, I I do love them all. And I think it's um, yeah no it's, it's it's all right. It doesn't make, it makes no difference to me. I listen. London London is unique in that what it does with the elites is just unreal. Um, yeah. it, I, I think in in his time and in, in his legacy. The one thing that I think is fair to say is he got the agents to play ball in a way that um, that there was no chance of that happening before. All the all the top athletes used to avoid one another. So, mm-hmm. and especially in the same training group, why would they? Why would you risk having a loser in your pack when you can have a winner at Chicago and a winner at London sure. and a winner at New York, sort of thing? You wouldn't. Okay, so you can separate them. Um, and keep them apart. So I think the one thing that that um, my old man did, and um, and you know, you can look at other sports where where boxing, you know, the the, the era of Pacquiao and uh, Mayweather and that, and you're sort of like, you know, you can have people, you can go through periods where that could have been unreal, but they they didn't fight each other. Yeah. Um, what a lost generation. Of course, they fought fought each other at the end, okay, for a little payday, but you know, it it it, it didn't really give us the you know, both of them at their peak. And and what London did was do that. You know, you, you, you've had, um, you know, some of them years. And there was a big, there was a big change of when it happened. Um, I can't remember the exact year, but, you know, Paul Turgat, Hailey, um, Kala Kanucci, you know, the world record, okay. Yeah, um, five and six, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was... That was big, big boy stuff, and um, yeah. and you know when you when you had five guys turning that 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 final corner, and yeah. they were all big guns, and you, it it almost feels horrible because it came down to a hundred meter race where you where you actually wanted that for a <laughs> little bit longer. I mean, sure. you apart, but yeah, so I think listen, I think that is something that um, made London big from an a, a elite point of view. Um, but you know, the, 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 you can then go with charity, viewership, and everything else. But you know, listen, it's it's a unique, it's certainly a unique event. But you know, you've got to appreciate, you know, all the others that that, that are well oh, sure. and some and that. So, but yeah, I think I think probably they're the two things I I guess would okay. would, would definitely make that. And then you've got the charity angle that um, you know came out, you know, sort of originated. You know, the whole almost third sector was originated from. Uh, my old man, um, a lot of it by chance, um, but yeah, and, and now fundraising is around the world and doing so much good, um, so much good, and taps into um, so many good, you know, good feelings across the world. Well, yeah, the World Marathon Majors have done a great thing in building the uh, sport, and like you said, they all have unique places. I mean, I ran Boston and ran New York, and. Uh, I just remember uh, Fred LeBeau telling me, the uh, race director in New York, that he had actually only told the city they were going to do the five boroughs race for one year in 1976, and he just kind of bullshitted his way each year. And and that's one of the things you love about the guy. He was a whack job, but each <laughs> event had their whack jobs, you know, and it, it just it's made this vibrant sport. We're going to get into the pandemic issues now. Um and we've been dealing with coronavirus since, uh, well, I was supposed to be in Europe in February. I called a buddy at CDC, and he said, uh, don't go. I said, yep. well, I said, this is big shit. And uh, I just came back from Dubai, gone to, uh, I was with Wetmore and uh, the New Balance Indoor. And then we headed back to <clears throat> Wisconsin and California. And mm-hmm. then uh, it hit. We got stuck in Wisconsin for two months and then California for five, and now I'm back in, in Wisconsin. How is the pandemic affecting running in the UK? I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely destroyed it. I mean, um, we pretty much, we've had nothing. I mean, you know, we had, we had a few nice track and fields. Um, they, they sort of got a good, not a bad um, sort of fall season. Um, <laughs> But road racing was was gutted. It, it was very sad because it it sort of put politically um, running in its place. When I, I, I now I've just started running again recently, but I, I, I've been playing soccer um, mm-hmm. on Saturdays and Sundays, and you know they got they got their 
um, they got their uh, stuffing. <laughs> they got they got themselves in gear. Their sport. I was going to swear, but I'm not sure where it's. Uh, but the they got their house in order. Yeah, and they were back playing. I was able to play five aside on Tuesdays and and eleven aside on full contact. Wow. With very little changes. You know, they they stopped the changing rooms, and that was pretty much it. They tried to introduce a couple of things, but it was just it lasted five minutes, and then everyone just carried on doing what they're doing. Um, it was very gutting that you know the the benefits that you've got from running from a park run point of view as well, not necessarily just all the paid paid events, but um it's taken our governing bodies a long time to get things in order and by the time that we had guidance uh, from the government that yes this uh, events and running of aces can go ahead but it's under these conditions um the second wave was coming back so um that was quite sad to see in that um i think we you know i think i th- you know what running does and what park run does for society is absolutely massive and the fact that football got came back before uh, running um has been massive Lo- loads of races have, have, have been cancelled and and um oh geez, I, I think a lot of them are under some real financial pressure now because originally it was not too bad all the spring races would just go to full um and they and they wouldn't know the difference now obviously that's that's not happening and they're not even going to go anywhere near um spring so um so yeah so there's it's going to be a big big knock on effects um you know that that's going to happen from some of the big bigger races um where but you know that's i guess these things are there and um and we we, we worked hard we were able to put on two uh, socially distanced 10k events uh, 1,900 on one day, 1,600 on the on the other. Wow. You know, not massive, but um, it gave it gave our industry a bit of hope, um, and and at least you know you put you know like a <laughs> like a like a running race. You know, you put down a an opener. You know, and then someone's yeah. got a world best, and then someone's going to try and do that. So, yeah, hopefully we can. You know, there's a lot of learn. It was really good for me personally because we had lots of running races, uh, race directors who came and helped us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we worked with it as a problem. Um, uh, you know, as a, a our problem and the um, the sports problem. If I failed, I would have probably set back a shed load of other races. Um, so it was really important that we we should have gone ahead and we we did it in a a proper race sort of setting you know in the same way that soccer matches came back and they were sort of exactly how they were we did the, we did the same but uh, you know very safe social distance all about access and regress um which are your main issues you know your cues not really during the race you know that's very very low risk from a transmission point of view mm-hmm. um so yeah so no it's 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 it's, it list, it's decimated most races are not happening now until until next spring. So we're we're probably going to be we were the, probably one of the last big races to happen. And we our next event, which is going to be the end of March, will probably be the next uh, the next one up again. So uh, touch wood and uh, yeah, it's 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 big. It's been big big change, but we'll get through it. What do you think of this virtual racing? Um. <sighs> Listen, I, 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 we did it. Um, we did it. London Marathon um, recently did it as well. Um, our third sector. It depends where you want to talk. Where, where do you want to talk about it from? You know. Okay. Um, you, if you want to look at it like sort of Peloton and, and how and how they were able to use technology to to forward the industry, um, yeah. I don't think we did that. I think I think it allowed a lot of people. Um, including myself to um, keep staff working um, to and and but you know put it this way I had two I had two emails from from people about it one email was um, you money gra- money grabbing bastards um, um, how, how you know I can't believe you're trying to charge you know fifteen bucks or whatever for for a medal and a tea or something like that okay you know I hope you burn in hell and then. And, and then I had another email um, from someone in Paris, actually, who said, 
can I just say thank you so much for doing the virtual thing? I've been looking for, I've been looking for something to get me out the door, and I relate to that because I need challenges, I need bets yeah. to to for me to go and do something. Um, so yeah, listen, it's I think like most things, it's it's there. I think it's a good option now in terms of everyone who's gone in and trained it. The London Marathon just did one recently, and I know New York did. Um, and, and, you know, it was really successful for a lot of charities, you know, they didn't raise what they were meant to, but they kept a lot of charities going. They kept a lot, kept a lot, a lot of people training, engaged in the sport. So, um, I don't, I don't, don't see it hurting the industry. Sure. Um, you know, I think like everyone, it's a, it's a nice sort of temporary, um, thing that we, we can enjoy and then, um, but it won't take over the real thing. Uh, what's your PB in the marathon? Uh, 219 and change, 30. Was that at Dublin? No, no, that was 224. I did 219 in Florence, um, um, and that was, a, that was a couple of years later. Was that on a bet with your father? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was, that was um, yeah, a drunken... So I used to be all right, I used to be all right distance runner, uh, like a good junior. Uh, never went to major championships or anything like that, but um, I quit the sport and went around America, um, yeah. where I worked for for beer and food um, at all these races in the states, and came back um, with a belly. And um, but after after London Marathon one year, we're having a beer after a beer after you've joined me in that same pub, yes. the, one by the, the, the one on the Thames, the little one, and um, we were talking about. I was looking at the results and I said, oh, wow, um, Joe, whatever, ran 233 for a marathon. And someone went, oh, what do you reckon you can run a marathon? I said, well, I used to, I used to destroy this guy in cross country, you know, seven days a week. Easy. Um, I could run 225. And then it was like, you want to bet on that? I said, well, yeah, sure. I'll bet you a grand. Okay. A, a grand, a grand. So we went around the table. Okay. We we're up to six grand. Okay. I went outside and I did two things. I ran up. I rang up uh, two old coaches quickly, yeah, and asked um, and asked people about it, and just said, "Listen, it's not as bad. It's not as bad as I think it is, right?" And he was like, "No, oh, no, it's easy." And and then on the on the second call, I, I started having a, a cigarette in the window, <laughs> when, <laughs> so all the other guys can see me, right? Yeah, and I hate smoking; it's horrible. But I'm just borrowing some of the cigarette, okay? And I thought I was getting more confidence. So I thought I'd bring them back in and uh, and and you know a little fishing line out, okay? to see what else I can get. So it, it, all, in all, we got about, I, I, I probably earned 10, uh, about $13,000 for uh, myself and another $13,000 for the Intoto Foundation, which was um, Mike, oh, Long, sure. uh, Mike Long's um, charity. And um, yeah, so we, uh, we had some good there. And um, yeah, I enjoy taking many agents um, money. And um, that's yeah. important. That's yeah. important. Oh, it's, good to, it's good to get money back from them. Well, we're using, I'm using that as a little entree into something that you wanted to talk about. You've got a new event that you're uh, wanting to discuss, and mm-hmm. I'm going to let you kind of uh, uh, chat about that. You've got something yeah. coming up? Yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited. With the, so next, um, end of March next year, we've got our, um, you know, normally we're doing, our, we're doing a 10K and then a marathon, and, you know, that will be back and all dependent on COVID. But um, one of the, we've added on a Friday, Friday morning that we're going to be hosting the British Olympic trials. Um, and traditionally, this is all done in the London Marathon. You know, it's all part of the London Marathon. And, um, mm-hmm. and because London's um, was postponed and is now October uh, next year, um, yeah, we, we've we've been working on this trial. We we're originally working on it for last spring, and then and then so we had a course ready to go, and then things have now um, now it was then going to go. London just had an elite race, mm-hmm. and then and then you know um, and then the trial didn't go there. So yeah, so we're going to be hosting Q Gardens um, on the twenty sixth of March, um, an American style looped course in uh, in Q Gardens. Cool. Um, because of COVID, it won't be. Um, we, 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 it's very unlikely we're going to have spectators in from that point of view. But mm-hmm. um, it's going to be a you know seven and a bit laps, a loops course, all inside, hundred percent COVID, uh, uh, COVID secure um, 
And yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to it. After, after, after witnessing Central Park, uh, Ryan Hall smashing, uh, smashing out a, a, a 209 um, yeah. and, um, and being in Houston, um, there's nothing quite like an Olympic trial sort of loop course, and we've that hasn't happened um, for uh, you know for many 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 years in the in the UK. So um, we're really looking forward to it, and we're going to have the privilege of of putting it on. Um, it's nice and flat, so a lot of runners, um, you know, a lot of the UK guys need to get some times as well. So they're going to be able to achieve getting their times. Um, so yeah, no, we're just looking forward to it. Just really looking forward to it. Now in the British system, you'll have someone from that race who will actually be selected, but are all three selected from a trials race, or how do they work? So yeah, so it's not as it's not as simple as the US, where um, you know it's it, that adds that extra beauty of it. So we, you are allowed to pre-select uh, runners. Uh, one person, um, I think, was the marathon option this year, and then two can go through a trial if they've got the times and everything else. So um, out of everyone, there's only been one pretty pre-selected athlete, which is Callum Hawkins. Um, sure. Very, very great runner who's, mm -hmm. who's delivered over championships um, in, previously in that. And uh, so, yeah, but, that, but apart from that, there, there are now five race, uh, five spots available um, as long as the runners have ran the time. And if they get top two in this trial, they're going to Tokyo, so uh, yeah, that should awesome. be that, that should be quite exciting. Um, you know, the course is flat as a pancake. I think if we had London Marathon conditions from a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, we would be we would be in a better situation. They were very un unlucky with the weather there. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of trees. There's lots. It's a walled um, garden, so um, you know there's a a lot less. Um, a lot less wind and channeled wind that you get into a city and everything else. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and you know, as flat as a pancake as well. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking for them and add the trainers to it. They've got no excuses. But, um, cool. but yeah, no, I think we've got, I think we've got, it's going to be really exciting. We've been, We've been doing a lot of work over the last few years. Um, I've been helping out on the on the fringes. A guy, uh, a guy called Ben Potchy created the Night of Ten Thousand Meters Championship. No Ben, and, yeah, love that yeah, event. And, and we've been, um, you know, I've been. Um, it was my idea for a beer, a beer tent down the back straight um, with a tent going over, and um, we borrowed an idea from. Um, Australia, Zatapet 10K, where runners can go on to lane three and it just completely changes a, you know, a 10,000 meter race, especially the elites. So, yeah, so we've been, you know, there's been a lot of excitement about that. There's a lot, a lot of traditionalists in the sport. Um, enjoy them, enjoy them events. It's, it's, you know, it's the best night of the year um, from, from my personal point of view. We all, me and my old man go down there and we often get very, very drunk whilst watching it. Now, we won't be able to do that at Kew Gardens. It'll be slightly different, but um, at the same time, um, it's going to be quite exciting to see how the athletes will deal with um, this trial situation. Um, we'll, we'll, it will definitely be streamed, so um, we'll have ways of, uh, we'll be ways of watching it. Um, I'm not sure we've got like the same budget as you guys would have uh, for, for your trials. It is, sure. it's an, we, we, we can work, we can only work with what we've got. And oh, sure. Maybe, maybe fingers crossed we can get a sponsor that can come in and, um, and really allow us to project it in a, in, in a fun way. But uh, yeah, I'm listen on a, on a raw, on a raw level, um, a, a trialed marathon loops course, which I've experienced as I said in the States, um, is stunning and um, and I'm looking forward to that sort of whole that attention being on the athletes who's going to thrive under that pressure and who's going to um, you know feel really bad and have to drop out and um, so I'm looking forward to that but yeah the 26th of March should be good. Well you've recommended us to come to the night of 10,000 PBs and I did that three years I loved it um, and a couple of good stories from that one. Sober, Larry. I know, I know, and then you, I drove you back. Over with, and, and works and everything else. Okay, you need to come out, come over just on just on the beers. Yes, I think that sounds good. And then I'm going to do my best to be at your trials because uh, yep. I look forward to that. I love the, just the whole feeling of a trials event is exciting. The one in Atlanta this year, um, our friend Rich Kana did uh, just a Atlanta Track Club. I thought it was the best um, 
U.S. trials that I've been to since, what, 84. And um, it was that good. And I love the loop course, you know. And it was just the weekend before all hell broke loose with COVID. Yep. Because if you'd have done it one week later, it wouldn't have happened, you know. Yep. And uh, so I, I wish you the very best with that. And um, let's see. I wanted to throw – I'm going to throw – the names of five athletes at you and I want you're allowed three words to describe them. Okay? <laughs> three words, okay. Okay. Uh, Paul Turgot. Oh. Originally kind gentleman. <laughs> okay. Highly gave her Selassie. Um, the, the the a professor um, um, reminds me sorry three words um, professor, professor, um, a smiling professor, and I can't think of that third word, but a smiling okay. professor and, and also kind. Paul Radcliffe, Paul Radcliffe. Um, groundbreaking, um, uh, front runner. Okay. Uh, Chris Thompson. Um, can talk nonstop. <laughs> no, Chris, 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 one of the most unlucky, probably yeah. an unlucky guy with so many injuries. One of them guys with no, just if he's had these, he had these injuries at the worst times and that very, very talented runner. Mo Farah. <sighs> wow. Um, two goals. <laughs> okay. um, and then finally, um, how would you describe London 2012 to people who were, had not been there? Just unreal. What I mean, <laughs> um, we've got this press release that's just about to to go out about the trials, and um, I sort of finished this press release by talking about um, Kew Gardens' involvement in 2012 and and what that meant to um, you know the spirit of 2012, um, everyone got along. It's the most completely polarized difference with, you know, with regardless of the politics that you've got, you know, how, where, where we're at at the moment, all yeah. around the world, we have Brexit, um, COVID, it's, it's nasty, nasty. And 2012 um, would be my happy place. Um, if I could ever, if I could ever um, time travel and go back for that summer, the weather, the weather just behaved. Yeah. Um, the music was was a great year for for British music, okay, and um, a lot of talented artists. Everything sort of just came together for that, um, you know, for that show, and um, and yeah, just unreal, unreal. Looking back at that, and you know, fingers crossed. If there's ever a time um, that we actually need a bit of 2012 um, Olympic spirit, it's um, it's right now. Tom Bedford, thank you so much for your time. It was great seeing you and your lovely uh, wife and partner, Jade. Enjoy Portugal. Uh, have a beverage for me this afternoon, okay, or this evening. What yeah, time is it over there right now? We are 6 o'clock. We're 6 o'clock now, but... Okay. Yeah. All right. It's okay. We've been, we've been drinking since 12, so, you know. Good. Thank it's, God. It's proper, you know, proper sort of, um, you know, uh, Spanish... It's Portuguese, you know, it's sort of, you know, you can have a, you can have a drink at lunchtime, so life's, so life's not so bad. It's a bit more relaxed. Well, it's good to see your charming countenance, and thank you for uh, keeping me smiling for 45 minutes, my friend. Hey, and stay strong, and, um, yep, we'll see each other soon. See you right. in, uh, on the 26th of March. Sounds good. Cheers. Talk to you soon. All right, this is Larry Eater with Run Blog Run and Socialing the Distance. Tom Bedford, race director at Richmond Run Fest and the upcoming British Olympic trials next March. Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater, Run Blog Run. Uh, this is the program Socialing the Distance. This week we featured Tom Bedford, who is the co-race director with his wife, Jade, of the Richmond Run Fest. It is a unique event in lovely London. Um, he admits that he stole many of the great ideas from some of the events that he learned while um, being mentored in the U.S. Um, what uh, Tom did for several years was work for many of the finest road races in the United States, everywhere from rock and roll events with the incomparable Tracy Sumlin 
to New York City, to Chicago, to Boulder. He was everywhere. Um, and he learned the trade. Um, Tom had also gone to school with Mo Farah at St. Mary's, uh, was a quite accomplished athlete. Um, his dad is the former world record holder at 10,000 meters, a Olympian, Commonwealth Games athlete, as well as one of the founders of the London Marathon, where Tom worked for many years. Um, I met Tom, I believe, first time we spent some time together was back in like 1998, 99 at Road Race Management in Florida. We had a, a rather liquid evening and uh, got to spend a little time together and enjoyed each other's company. And uh, thanks to him and his dad and uh, Sir Ian Stewart, um, I got to experience British athletics, British road racing, and uh, learned a lot of good lessons. Um, so Tom and I spoke today. Uh, there in Tom and his wife are in uh, Portugal for a bit of a break from the coronavirus in the UK. And he wanted to see the sun where they could do their morning runs along the cliffs uh, of Portugal. And uh, so we talked today about the founding of the Richmond Run Fest. And essentially, uh, Tom took a lot of the lessons he learned from races in North America, the big medals at rock and roll, the uh, music and entertainment, the beer fest afterwards, um, the uh, uh, courses through colorful areas. He took care of elite events, managed high-quality elite events on the limited budget he has. Uh, you had Chris Thompson among uh, multiple winners at the, the event. Um, he actually think he had Mo in a couple of the early events as well. And... Um, People didn't even believe uh, that he knew Mo Farah. So the funny story on the uh, interview, so you'll be able to check that out. Uh, Tom Bedford is rather self-deprecating, but the truth is this. He is one of the most creative people that I know. <clears throat> he is one of the finest uh, event directors. He gets running, um, but he also is good about the behind-the-scenes things, bringing in sponsors, managing that and him and his wife, Jade, have built this event into a top-notch and unique event in London. Um, we talked about how Richmond came about, how there had never been any races in this uh, botanical uh, park, and how he was able to put it together, and the challenges uh, wrought with that. Um, he had the support of Nike and... Uh, John Capriotti, who he said good things about, um, who put together a sponsorship for that event. And um, that was a big help. As any race director knows, if you've got a couple of good sponsors, that allows you to focus on making the event better. And I always love the pictures they have from the event each year where they would have the top athletes sitting in a, um, a, a regal chair. It looks like a king's throne. And it was kind of fun, and they had fun with it. The ability to combine elite and how to treat elite athletes, which he learned from the late Mike Long. Mike was a longtime elite athlete coordinator for rock and roll, um, and we lost him uh, over a decade ago. But he was a great guy, and Tom spent a lot of time with him and learned good things from him. And... Um, when you're mentored by the best, that's a very fortunate thing, and Tom has been. He also got to watch his dad develop the London Marathon and um, pay special attention to how Tom answered my question about the London Marathon. Each year when I would go to London, and I went for, <clears throat> oh gosh, 15, 16 years, um, there was an event uh, that I would attempt to get tickets for. And thanks to Glenn Latimer, a very thoughtful <laughs> uh, former athlete's agent, charming Brit, and also childhood chum of uh, Dave Bedford, um, I would be able to go to this event, which was on a barge 
parked right next to the Guam and hotel. And you obviously dressed nice tie and suit and all those kind of things. It was in the evening for a couple hours and there were beverages and, and you got to see everybody. And, uh, David would open up the event, Tom's dad, David Bedford, and would open up the event with welcome to the finest marathon in the world. And he was just screwing with people. He loved to give people a little bit of shit. And, uh, his sense of humor can be described as um, eccentric, um, which I appreciated. But what I liked about that event was that you had all these great race directors in one place. The World Marathon Majors is really an amazing thing because these race directors should have been killing each other. And they found a way to cooperate and what they did is they built a series. It's the envy of the world. They also were at the forefront of doping, anti-doping, and they've caught some big cheaters. And the only way you know doping works is when you catch big cheaters. And I don't know uh, why my phone still works, even though I have it on uh, airplane mode. But, hey, uh, I've digressed. Um I think that the challenge is on putting on an event is you get so involved with it. How do you work with others? Um, uh, Bob Bright and the late Fred LeBeau used to play each other off New York and Chicago in the U.S. And it built the races. There was controversy. It was written about in the papers, the Runner magazine, George Hirsch's amazing magazine. Um, again, one of my favorites. I worked at Runner's World always admired the runner magazine and what they uh, did. Um, and runners were all wrote about these events and the controversy between bright and LeBeau. And while I know a lot of it was kind of Barnum and Bailey, um, it got people excited about marathoning. Um, London each spring, the week or so after Boston was part of my haunts. I was in Boston for the week. Uh, and then I would go to London and that's how we helped to started developing a global business. Uh, you had to be in London, you had to be in Boston, you had to be in New York. Um, and uh, Chicago, I was in Chicago every year for, gosh, since, what, 1990. Kerry um, and Mike Nishi do an amazing job there. Been to Berlin several times. Um, have not been to Tokyo. Really want to go to Tokyo one of these days. And uh, and I will. Um but uh, World Marathon Majors really help put marathoning on the map. And Tom Bedford said it best that each one's unique. He was very politic about it, too. And what is number one? Good question. I always thought Boston, for its iconicness, was amazing. I thought New York, for just being the media capital of the world, fantastic. I thought London, modeled after New York, became its own place. And under David, and then now under Chris Brasher, um, uh, I think that uh, they're doing uh, a tremendous job. How do you survive during COVID? Uh, Tom was ballpark frank in saying that, uh, quite frankly, British <clears throat> road racing has been decimated, as it has in the U.S. Um, the virtual racing is admirable. Uh, a tip of the hat to um, um, Emily Sisson, who went 238.22 on her own with her, her hubby on a bike next to her down in San Diego to do a virtual marathon. And I know at Boston, they had someone go 221 and a woman go 240. So pretty cool. And I think people need the outlet. And Tom said that best. Running is a personal activity, but also going to these big races is a way of sharing and celebrating our lives and fitness. I was in Boston in 2013. I was about, oh, a quarter of a mile from the bombing, uh, sitting in the media center when we heard a boom, boom, and James O'Brien, a dear friend, uh, editor at the New York Athletic Club publication, looked at me and said, Larry, that was a bomb. And uh, I've never forgotten it. Um, I also had around my neck that day uh, uh, a pass to sit in the stands right where the bomb went off. Um, I never went to finish lines because I was always fearful of that. Um, and the I, I could write about 
the Boston bombing for a couple of years. It still uh, upsets me. Uh, I'm glad that it wasn't the, the people who did it didn't understand running. Um, but what people did that day was pretty amazing. And uh, it's like what I felt um, when they did New York after the year of 9-11. Um, it was uh, pretty amazing and pretty standing tall. Um, I think the virtual races are needed now. Uh, I want to get back to regular races. Uh, Tom put on the last couple races that were actually uh, uh, allowed people to socially distance uh, in London. And uh, bravo to him for that. But that's the kind of thing that he and uh, Jade are good at. And they know how to have fun. And they know how to run a business. And to be a race director, you got to be a good business person too. Um, because otherwise the event doesn't stay around. And that uh, is can be a challenge. Uh, we talked about Tom um, running a 219 marathon on a bet um, uh, where he donated made $13,000 to um, the Untoto Foundation, which was a, a, a nonprofit set up in honor of uh, the late Mike Long, the elite director at uh, um, Rock and Roll. Uh, and then uh, Tom made a few bucks too. He was betting with his dad and, uh, and a bunch of his mates. And uh, uh, 219, pretty damn impressive. Um, but... I think uh, Tom could have uh, run faster. He had a bit of a couple injury things, and uh, uh, but pretty dang impressive. Um, we also talked about a new event that he's going to be doing next spring. Um, they're going to announce uh, in the upcoming week that the British Olympic marathon trials for men and women will be held on a, a seven-loop course um, in the uh, Richmond uh, Botanical Park area. And um, they'll do that on the Friday before they do their uh, normal events. Um, probably no fans allowed. Uh, obvious. Uh, um, there'll be great remote coverage, and hopefully we'll see how they do streaming and things. We'll be able to tell you more next week. But... Um, I think it's pretty cool that he's putting it on and the course is flat and fast and dynamic. And uh, obviously Tom was influenced by seeing the 2012 Olympic trials around central park. And also um, we chatted a little bit about how well Rich Kanan, the team at the Atlanta track club had just put on the U S 2020 trials, probably the finest marathon trials that I've seen. I love the circuit course. I love the quarter of a million fans. It was just before COVID went crazy and we needed that event. Um, and Atlanta hosted it very, very well. But uh, Tom is going to be putting on the uh, British Olympic trials next spring. And we wish him luck with that. And we hope to be covering that. He um, also talked about the night of 10,000 PBs that uh, his buddy Ben Pucci and their club uh, put on. I've been to the night of 10,000 PBs several times. I did leave standing erect and also um, not under the influence of too many adult beverages. One night I had to drive back. Um, well, what do we do? Yeah, we had, we had to drive back to Manchester because there was a road race and track meet the next day. And that was speeding with the crazy man from New Balance. And uh, watch for that story coming up. Um, yeah, we broke land speed records on the way back. Um, but uh, the event was a lot of fun. Um, and, and Tom came up with the idea of having a beer tent uh, over lane three, where you could cheer on the 10,000 meter runners. And they had, I think, seven or eight heats men and women's heats, and uh, the final one was um, a European Cup 10,000-meter event as well as a British trials event, and I'll tell you, it was exciting. Um, Adam and I uh, went over in, uh, I believe, 2017 to enjoy and see the event, and uh, I've missed it 
terribly since then. So uh, I hope to get back when this pandemic thing gets under control and uh, um, see that event as well as uh, hopefully next year, the British trials. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's going to be a plethora of major events, mar marathons next spring. Uh, and that's because people expect the pandemic to be around. Everything's set up for the fall, with the exception of Boston. So we'll have to see how that goes. But had a lovely chat with Tom Bedford today. Got to check in with his uh, wife and uh, race partner, um, Jade and uh, Bedford. And uh, they're in Portugal enjoying a little bit of a break. Hope to see them soon. Thanking them again for their time. Tom is always a lot of fun to talk with and uh, just a good guy. One of those people that you want to sit down like his pop and uh, have a few pints with. Uh, thank you to Mike Deering for managing socialing the distance and trying to manage me, which I know is a 12 step program. And uh, thanks to my son for gently trying to manage me, which is really difficult. That is a 12 step program. And I think I'm on the first step. Um, and thank you to our viewers, listeners, readers. Um, if you like us, please sign up for Twitter, Instagram, and the Facebook. I used to call it the Facebook, which would annoy the hell out of my son, so I still do. But if you love us, sign up for the YouTube and check out our channel. We've got, we don't have 500 videos. I think we have closer to 1,000 now. Um, I just like to grow the numbers exponentially. But, uh, and then on the other part, please stay safe. If you're going to be indoors, no matter where you're at in the world, wear a mask, okay? And stay out of the indoors as much as you can. If you're going to be outdoors, take a mask with you. And if you can't be six feet apart, wear the mask. Wash your hands 20 seconds. Do it several times a day, okay? Wash your mask. The pandemic is real. Wearing a mask does not attack your sexuality. Wearing a mask is patriotic, whatever country you're in. Because guess what? When you're patriotic, you're caring about other people. And that's what wearing a mask is about. If you're not going to get sick, you're going to keep other people from being sick. And the truth is, masks do work. The CDC says so. Dr. Fauci says so. And no matter what political stuff you want to put into those things, they're good and honorable people. Republicans and Democrats, Tories, Whigs, everybody can like them, okay? Whatever party you're part of, just cut the crap. Science is real. It doesn't take away from your belief in God. Actually, many people find comfort in the beliefs in science and the beliefs in their religion. So I don't understand how people are belittling the CDC, are belittling Dr. Fauci, are belittling science. It's not patriotic. Okay? So, I've got past all my little weird things. I'm going to have my third cup of uh, Joe today from Trader Joe's. I drink the dark coffee there. And I should just pour the coffee grounds on my arms and rub them. And then I'd be much more efficient. Larry here with Run Blog Run signing off. Have a great day.